to another episode of The Microbe Moment, the show that brings you down to the microscopic level to view the world just a little bit differently. Today, we are going to talk about the bleakest moment in microbiology history. Are you ready, John? I am, Tess. Let's give it a shot. So what are we talking about today, then? Well, before we jump into it, or the bleakest moment, I'd like to say some happy notes. Um, I would just like to say thank you to all the people that have rated us on iTunes over the past couple of weeks. Uh, it really does help us. We really do appreciate it. So just a shout out to Sir Queens, Jem Jed Jeg 68, Antonia's, and Naginin. Uh, for leaving us a review or comments and rating us. Uh, it really does help us. So thank you so, so much. And if you haven't yet, please um, give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. All right. Now that we've thanked our listeners, what are we talking about today, Tess? So today we are talking about the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. Is that the uh, study that was conducted for over 40 years? Yes, this is one of the worst, uh, perhaps, medical studies of all time. I think it's the longest medical study, longest non-therapeutic study of humans ever conducted to record date <laughs> in recorded time. And so this study has a lot of implications that we're still seeing today. Uh, it has really started a generations of mistrust among the black Americans in our country. And we can see this um, today as we are going through the COVID pandemic. The Harris Poll reports that 43% of black Americans plan to get the coronavac coronavirus vaccine when it comes out. This is compared to the 58% of white Americans that plan to get it. That's a pretty big gap. It is. It's very significant. I can't exactly blame them due to the mistrust that this uh, study helped uh, plant in a group of people. Yeah, there's a number of factors that play into the mistrust. Um, the systemic racism in the medical institution, for one, and the blatant racism that we have throughout the country, social economic issues. There's so many factors. Um, but a lot of people attribute the Tuskegee syphilis study lies at the heart of many of these sources. Right. And so in 1932, surprisingly, the United States Public Health Service gathered 600 black males, 399 had syphilis and 201 did not. These, quote, volunteers were being treated for what they call bad blood. And they were told that they would get free burial insurance, food, and medical examinations as compensation. However, in reality, they are only getting blood tests, spinal taps, and autopsies, but never treatment. And those that have gotten spinal taps know it is a very uncomfortable procedure to go through. Right, so let's preface this a little bit in some historical background. So the Tuskegee study happened in 1932. So this was just after um, the step, the great stock market crash of 1929. So we're in kind of the heart of the Great Depression where there is not a lot of funding. Originally, this study did start as a way um, to for treatment, for a mass treatment of the rural black community, which was being plagued more severely with syphilis than other parts of the country. However, with the Great Depression occurring, they lost a lot of their funding and they were no longer able to have or offer any treatment. So instead, uh, they were just going to do observations. And there's a reason for this, um, for, for why they were looking at long-term observations, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So we have a study that went on for 40 years but what they were telling participants, they weren't telling them that they were studying syphilis. No, they just were telling them that they were treating them for bad blood. And that's all they really knew. Yeah, and bad blood at this time was really a catch-all phrase 
Um, for a lot of ailments, like you have bad blood if you're bipolar, or you have bad blood if you're fatigued, or you have bad blood if you have syphilis or gonorrhea. It really was not very specific. No, there was very vague uh, public surface announcement posters, particularly in like World War One and Two, that warned against bad blood. But as you said, it was a catch-all. Yeah, and we also have to think of this in terms of the participants. This is the 1930s, um, rural black communities. A lot of the participants were sharecroppers. They didn't have access to education. Their lives were not that much different than their grandparents or parents who were slaves. Um, it's just not that even long ago from the 1930s. So we have a very vulnerable population um, who is giving their trust, so to speak, into these research institution. And the research institution, the researchers claiming to treat them for bad blood, did a terrible job at protecting this vulnerable population. What their bad blood actually was, was syphilis. So we're going to tell you a little bit of what syphilis is. So syphilis is a bacteria uh, called treponemia pallidum. Did I say that right? Treponema pallidum. Uh, well, you know what? I'm going to call that as a win. <laughs> so this bacteria, normally when you see bacteria, they're your circles or they're rods. This one's pretty different because it's a spiral. Yeah, and we call this a spirochete as a shape or morphology in microbiology. And this microbe has about a million base pairs in its genome, which is actually a quarter uh, size smaller than that of E. coli. So this really small genome means that it relies on the host for a lot of its uh, metabolism and a lot of its functions. So even today, we can't really grow syphilis. A lot of syphilis studies actually occur in rabbits. Right. Uh, what's curious about the fact that it has less genomes is it's still able to escape the reactive oxygen species that our white blood cells produce to fight infections. Yeah, so reactive oxygen species are kind of like these bursts of oxygen that your body or host is able to produce. And the drastic change in oxygen levels will actually stress out the microbe to the point of killing it. Right. And so this is a very, um, I wouldn't say simple, but primary form of our immune system. And this is actually, this inf disease is actually a lot older than some might think. Uh, it's been written down in history, even as far as... Uh, Columbus. Yeah. Some people believe Columbus was the reason that syphilis spread across the world. Um, there, I mean, there are many theories about where syphilis has come from, but the disease itself, Treponema pallidum, or the bacterium itself, Treponema pallidum, has been around for hundreds of years. And it's also gone by many names, particularly when it started breaking out during war. Uh, names and blame began to fly, and people didn't know what it was, but clearly the enemy was responsible for the deterioration and deaths of their soldiers. In reality, their soldiers were just sleeping with women from the other countries who may have had it. Right. And so you had names like the disease of Naples, or the French disease, or the Spanish disease. The Germans even called it the French evil, or it became because it had this pox-like um, appearance, it became known as the French pox while the Russians named it after the Polish, and the list goes on and on, and it circles all the way around in Europe. So it's got a very interesting history, and it's impacted humanity substantially throughout our time here on this earth for the last couple centuries. But what we know about the microbe today, although it's more, is actually not too different from what researchers knew 88 years ago. Because it has plagued humanity for so long, a lot of research throughout time has been on Treponema pallidum. Yeah, so we know that Treponema pallidum is transmitted through body fluids, often through sexual relations. 
The disease occurs in four distinct stages. The primary stage, uh, canker, appears usually at the genitals, anus, or mouth, which usually disappears in a few weeks. In the secondary stage, symptoms such as fever, headaches, sore throat, and rash begin. Joint pain, anorexia, and mucus patches on the mouth, genitals, or anus may also occur. This leads to a latent syphilis, which has no symptoms. And then tertiary, tertiary syphilis can occur after that, 10 to 30 years uh, after your initial infection. Uh, what they call gumas appear, which are lesions on the skin and bones. The disease can impact internal organs, the eye, and even the nervous system called neurosyphilis, leading to death. Yeah, and what's so interesting about this disease is that it manifests in different people differently, which is why they wanted, the researchers originally wanted to observe how syphilis would manifest. And at the start, when they were going to do treatments and when there wasn't a lot of um, treatment out there, it becomes a lot um, easier to understand where they're coming from. However, uh, they did not conduct the study very well. And they did not take very good notes. And there just was not a lot of great science that came from this study. So we know now that this disease is quite terrible. It has very interesting yet horrifying manifestations in its victims. Right. And so at the time the study began, penicillin wasn't around. And the only treatment was heavy metals, right? Yeah, so they would actually just inject you with mercury, which is super fun. Uh, you lose your hair and like your teeth fall out and you go crazy and um, doesn't sound like a treatment, huh? No, but they did eventually uh, graduate to arsenic which wasn't nearly as bad, but it's still a poisonous heavy metal. Yeah, and so they actually had a derivative of arsenic, and this was discovered by Paul Uric in the early 20th century. And what they called, originally called this derivative of arsenic was uh, 606. You know why they called it 606? Because they failed 605 times before. Yeah, so the... They failed 605 times before they found 606 was the correct derivative that had the potential of curing syphilis. They originally called this new drug the magic bullet and later called it silvaricin. After that came another um, drug called neosilvaricin. And this was in the 1910s time frame. And they actually won, he, Paul Urich actually won a Nobel Prize for this discovery. In 1928, Alexander Fleming made his accidental discovery of penicillin that revolutionized medicine. Throughout the warring years, they figured out how to mechanize this penicillin and was able to mass produce it um, to help millions of people. Right, that came around during World War II and really helped the Allied forces. In 1947, penicillin was officially coined as the new cure for syphilis. But the participants were never told that there was a cure for their bad blood. They weren't even told that their bad blood was syphilis. So even throughout World War II, throughout all the Nazi concentration, experimentation, the Nuremberg, Court, the Nuremberg Code, the civil rights movement, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., through all these major events, the syphilis study continued on. And it would take one whistleblower seven years of his life to actually bring this study to a halt. Yes, and this whistleblower's name was Peter Buxton. He was actually a public service, public health service uh, employee working as a venereal disease contact tracer in San Francisco when he actually heard about the Tuskegee study. It reminded him, as we said, of the Nazi doctors and the horrible experiments conducted in the concentration camps. 
As a result, he wrote a report highlighting the parallels, which his employees thought were a little extreme. Yeah, they were unable to really under or to put themselves in that frame and that frame of mind to under to think that America could be on the same low level of the Nazi scientists. It was not something they were willing to even fathom. Right. They they thought that they were above it. Correct. And there is also kind of this understanding or this justification, I guess, among the researchers who were still conducting the study that they had a moral obligation to those that had already died in the study to see it through, which makes no sense at all. No. I mean, if you really wanted the moral obligation, you would be treating the remaining of the patients with the penicillin. Yeah. And to like have some moral justification that because it's so immoral, you morally have to continue it. What? Yeah. I just, I cannot even figure out how that justification works. But people would use it. Uh, another justification that people, um, they could put their blinders up and pretend that the study doesn't exist because a lot of people, um, especially back then, you were at a job for your whole life. Um, in the 1960s, you still had a lot of single income family homes. And so if the person who, who became the whistleblower decides to blow the whistle on their employee, they can fire you and you are no longer able to provide for your kids. Not just that, it's a possibility that you get blacklisted because of that. Right, and you don't, so it has, there's a lot of consequences to whistleblowing and we really should just understand the bravery that is necessary and the courage that is necessary to actually blow the whistle. Um, I mean, if you think of it, whistleblowing is a positive connotation for words like betrayal and backstabbing and all these other terrible words that we hope no one ever does to us. Right. So before Peter Baxton, Buxton, there were others who tried to blow the whistle and stop the study. One of them was Bill Jenkins, a black epidemiologist in the CDC. He also wrote a report on the study, but neither his nor Buxton's reports would be enough to bring the Tuskegee study to a halt. Sometimes it's not what you know, but who you know that writes history. Do you know who Peter Buxton knew? Who did he know? So Peter Buxton eventually became acquainted with a reporter at the Associated Press named Edith Letterer. Now, she was also horrified with what she saw. And because of this, she brought the documents that Buxton provided her to her boss. And her boss, who was, again, horrified, handed the story to a more experienced writer, Jean Heller. And so they published uh, a story with the headline, Syphilis Victims in the U.S. Study Went Untreated for 40 Years. And this hit newsstands on July 25th in 1972. Unfortunately, it was too late for the participants of the Tuskegee study. Yeah, like we said, this study went on for 40 years. Remember, it started in 1932. It is now 1972. Yeah, and only 74 of the subjects were still alive. Yeah, 128 had died from syphilis or complications of the disease. And 40 spouses had also contracted the disease as well as a number of children. Right. Those... And grandchildren, I think, as well. Oh, really? I did I not know so. that. so, yeah. And so, yeah, this legacy of mistrust and the study's descendants still live on today as a result. So in the end, the descendants did receive a $10 million settlement from the U.S. government. They also got lifetime medical benefits and burial. Bur burial. Bur oh, no. Burial? Burial. Burial. There we services. go. So these benefits were extended to the children and their spouses. And the last participant in the study passed away in 2004. And the last widow passed away in 2009. The fact this study went on for 40 years is very disturbing. If you haven't figured out <laughs> that we think it's disturbing by this point. Just, just, you know, we think it's a little off. At least. No, it was terrible. But even more is so when you consider how different it was, it would have been if the participants were white. The study and all its fallout serve as a reminder to 
us all that racism exists. Yeah, I think it's really an interesting history point to remember and to understand as scientists and as the public. The fallout of the study only occurred because a scientist decided to communicate his concerns to the public. And the public was diligent enough to listen and to respond. So I think it really creates this cycle or this system where scientists need to be engaging with the public and communicating with the public. And the public has to engage back. Yeah, and scientists also need to be vigilant and hold their other colleagues accountable for their research. So perhaps together we can ensure that these standards are kept and the injustices of the past and present do not continue into our futures. Do you have anything else to say? No, I think you did a great job telling this story. All right, so my Crowbigal Nation, that brings us to the end of our show. We hope that you enjoyed it, and if you did, please subscribe or tell a friend, because as we said, science needs to be communicated, and we need your help to do that. You can find us at microbigals.com. That's M-I-C-R-O-B-I-G-A-L-S dot com. So remember to feed, feed your, your mind, feed your, your guts, guts, make your, your microbes, microbes love you lots. Bye! Bye.